right. Uh, good morning and welcome uh, to the Mid-Atlantic Telehealth Resource Center's uh, Summit. Um, my name is John Chu. I'll be moderating uh, this morning's uh, plenary uh, uh, panel session, and it uh, gives me great uh, pleasure uh, and, and quite humbling, actually, to uh, have a great panel today. Uh, today, we've got De David McSwain. Uh, Dr. McSwain is the Chief Information uh, uh, Chief Medical Information Officer for MUSC Health in Charlestown, South Carolina, uh, a co-founder of, of SPROUT, uh, which stands for Supporting Pediatric Research and Outcomes and Utilization of Telehealth and the National Telehealth Research Network and the South Carolina Children's uh, Telehealth uh, Collaborative. And he's the main principal investigator for an NIH funded SPROUT CTSA uh, Telehealth Research uh, Collaborative Grant and is the chair of the section on telehealth uh, care at the American Academy of Pediatrics. So thank you, Dave. We also have uh, Judd Hollander, uh, and Dr. Judd Hollander is uh, Senior Vice President of Healthcare Delivery Innovations at the Thomas Jefferson University and Associate Dean for Strategy Health Initiatives at Sydney Kimmel Medical College at Thomas Jefferson University and Professor and Vice Chair of Finance and Healthcare Enterprises in the uh, Department of um, Emergency Medicine. And uh, we also uh, uh, also have Tina Gustin, uh, and Dr. Uh, Tina Gustin is Associate Professor of Nursing at Old Dominion University, co-director of the Center for Telehealth Innovation, Education, and Research at uh, the Old Dominion University, and clinical manager for telehealth at the Children's Hospital of King's Daughter. So thank you very much uh, to our panelists for joining today. Um, I think the um, format today will be really uh, uh, more discussion, quali uh, you know, Q and A, um, and what I like to uh, encourage the uh, audience to actually, um, uh, you know, uh, show your video. And um, when you have a question, you can either enter it into the chat box, which uh, I'll be monitoring, or you can unmute yourself uh, and raise your hand and, and ask your question. So uh, we like this to be as interactive as possible. And um, one of the great things about moderating um, for this for this kind of panel is that. Uh, both Judd, Tina, and David have a collective um, experience of, like no other, so I, I don't have, even have to say much. Uh, and, and we can just uh, 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 yeah, go on with the discussion, so it's great. So before we do that, uh, David and I actually had a panel, uh, was on a panel yesterday about uh, collaborative research, and we did a poll. And what I like to do is just kind of uh, show the, um, in the result of the poll, which is quite interesting. We asked two questions to the audience. Um, the, the first one was, what type of research study would you most, would be most comfortable doing? And the second question, what type of research study do you want to see more of? And what's really interesting is that most people uh, were very comfortable uh, with doing quality improvement type of uh, research, uh, followed by descriptive studies, follow, and then uh, followed by research trials. Um, and, but the type of research that people really wanted to see more of uh, was trials uh, and descriptive studies. So I found that to be interesting. And then maybe what we can do in our discussion today is really kind of uh, talk a little bit to why we think that you know this is it and how useful maybe these research trials would be for uh, operations. So um, I want to just start with this quote. And I love this quote because I think this is a testament to many of uh, our audience today, even as they embark on telemedicine, uh, if not now, but maybe even more relevant about a year ago before the pandemic, where, uh, you know, if you can, and Martin Luther King said, if you can, can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. And I think many of you here and, and our panel for sure uh, really. <laughs> Uh, has been trying to keep things moving forward. A little easier now than it was about a year ago, but nevertheless. So what we're going to do today um, is to have topic rounds uh, and we wanna address each of these bullet points. And, but before we do that, I wanna just give five minutes to each of our panelists to describe their programs uh, and, 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 and to kind of introduce uh, them, their program to the audience. So maybe um, we can go, Judd, you wanna, you wanna go first? Sure. So, so I'm going to ask you to imagine I have a slide, but I'm not actually going to show you a slide because I think it'll keep you a little more engaged. But, but the theme of the Jeff Connect program at Jefferson is we went all in at once. We didn't pilot little things and we used all of our own providers. We didn't kick things out to a provider network to help supplement our care. And, and, and although we use APPs where APPs are used, 
mo most of our program is done by physicians. So I'm gonna ask you to imagine a clock and I'm gonna ask you to start at six o'clock. And many of you that have been to Matrix before have seen this presentation and seen the Jeff Connect wheel. So this should be easy for you. But if you start at six o'clock, imagine the inner part of it is the patient. And the patient is at their baseline at six o'clock. And as they get a little sick, they move to seven o'clock. If they get more sick, they move to nine or 10 o'clock. And if they get sick enough, they show up in the emergency department where the clock strikes 12. In the emergency department at my shop and yours, about 25% of it, patients are admitted and at one or two o'clock is the acute care setting. And at my shop and yours, we do a pretty good job and 99% of them go home and they go back from two to three to four to five to six o'clock where they reestablish their baseline. That's the way to think about the patient. Now we layered programs all around the patient care cycle and, and I'm gonna walk you through them. Um, and you just sort of have to remember the inner wheel as you speak to it, although it, it's not really that important. At nine o'clock in our outpatient setting, we have our Jeff Connect on demand program. So we like many of you take care of anybody in our community, which for us is Pennsylvania, New Jersey and Delaware. We have our own emergency physicians, the people who work in our ER and urgent care center on call 24 seven, 365 fielding calls from Jefferson patients and non-Jefferson patients. We see them on our Jeff Connect platform. We document in our electronic medical record. Our care processes are just like an in-person visit. They get registered, they get discharge instructions, they get communicated with, a copy of the chart goes to their primary care physician and, and lives within the Jefferson records. As we move from nine o'clock to 12 o'clock when they may show up in the ER, we actually have a program we call the virtual emergency department. So we have now carved off some of those emergency physicians and created an on-demand core with about 10 people. That core does what we call the virtual emergency department. So they can actually upscale the outpatient virtual care. So they might be able to get an ultrasound or a CAT scan or results of blood tests back, make the appropriate referral and never ever send the patient to the ER by passing off those patients to the next shift and making sure we close the loop. We use that enormously for COVID testing, um, you know, during the peak of COVID and, you know, still now where we're starting to get a little resurgence in the, the Philly area. Um, in the emergency department itself, we do tele-intake. This is a program where you come into the emergency department, you are seen almost immediately, like nine to 14 minutes later by a provider. This is mostly APPs now, and they will see you do your initial intake, order your labs, x-rays, and whatever you need, um, and write a note. And so you'll go from intake to EKG to x-ray to get your bloods drawn unless a room is open. If a room is open and you can be seen in the back by the emergency care team, you'll go right to the room. If not, rather than linger in the waiting room unknown where you may leave without being seen, you get your care started right away. And that has reduced our left without being seen and speed it and sped our uh, throughput processes significantly. In the acute care setting, we have a neurostroke network. I'm not gonna talk a lot about that. You know what a neurostroke network is, but we also have an ambulance telemedicine enabled stroke ambulance. So we, we've actually given lytics within 30 minutes of the ambulance call several times because the ambulance has a CAT scan and, tel uh, and telemedicine. So the patient can be imaged, the image viewed by a neurovascular specialist and, and lytics given. So uh, a pretty neat thing and we have great outcomes with that. In our acute care setting, we've done a couple of things. During COVID, we put tablets in every patient's room so we could bring expertise to the room without making the provider go in the room, particularly when we didn't have enough PPE for providers. And we're able to leverage that. Once there's a tablet in patients' rooms, they might as well have visitors on the tablets. So we set up a really neat way. You can go online, you click the hospital, the floor, the room, patient lets you in, boom, you're in the room with the patient. It's that simple. And, and so we can do that. From four to seven o'clock on our wheel, we do post-acute care, primary care, specialty care with, you know, basically we had over 1400 providers doing this pre-COVID. It's now, of course, like your shops, everybody, where you can schedule appointment and be seen. Additionally, there's remote patient monitoring, chatbots, and asynchronous e-visits uh, layer, layered onto that. So I, I will stop there.
but say we've tried to go all around the wheel. We have much more than that, but that's the basic core of our program. And, and the one relevant thing I'll say, which I think is important for research and clinical ops purposes, we don't do teledermatology and telecardiology. We do patient to provider telemedicine and provider to provider telemedicine because the operational and workflows are the same for these things. So synchronous patient to provider telemedicine doesn't matter what the specialty is or who the doctor or APP is. It's one workflow. So we've standardized our workflows and made them not specialty specific, which lends great credibility to the manners in which we could operationalize and do research. I'll stop there and pass it along to uh, Tina or Dave to go next. Thank you, Judd. Tina, um, want to go? Sure. So um, I'm going to come at this from a different angle. I have I wear two hats. I have an academic hat, and then I also have a clinical hat at the hospital. I'm going to speak to you um, really more about our academic hat and where we started. So through the Center for Telehealth Innovation, Education and Research um, at Old Dominion University down here in Norfolk and Virginia Beach, um, and around 2010, we, we're a team of three. And we realized that there really was not any or much published on telehealth education. So we started developing through grant funding, um, two week kind of training courses, realizing that IPP was an important aspect of academic <clears throat> education. So if we could fit telehealth into it, then that's the way we were gonna weasel telehealth into our education. Um, so that started in 2010, 2011. Um, from a research standpoint, we realized early on that there appeared to be barriers to good telehealth practice. And we identified early on telehealth etiquette, the interprofessional skills necessary for a good encounter, and how do you do these assessments remotely without peripherals. So we started collecting student data as we were teaching our students about this type of um, new tech, new delivery of care, air quote, if you will. So we collected um, qualitative, quantitative data, kind of as we move through the years, um, we then, began to develop tools. And I know everybody on the panel and probably um, many of you in this session, and, and you may remember back in 2015, we were kind of banging our heads on the table being, I was kind of the odd woman out at a conference where I was talking about education or talking about etiquette and everybody else was, well, what vendor are you getting and what delivery model are you doing? Um, so as we moved forward, um, we then looked at our data um, and started developing, again, instruments. We then worked through HRSA funding through an advanced practice nursing group to develop um, competencies off of Adelphi that were recently published. Um, using our research method, we came up with a model for framing the competencies, the planning, the preparing, the providing, um, and performance evaluation, which then led us, you know, kind of where are we now, to two years ago, our university came to the three of us and said, hey, I think you're a center. We'd like to give you center designation. And with center designation, um, we, we would like to support you further in your academic and research endeavors. And then COVID happened. I mean, we got center designation and COVID happened. And that's when the universities that we had been working with throughout our region because uh, we're an independent, we're not an independent, but we're a university without a medical school. So our, our local medical school came to us, another university with PharmD, another university with social workers. They came and said, hey, we're lost in the sauce here. We don't know how to provide our fourth year medical students for telehealth. We don't know what to do with our providers within the community that are now having to do telehealth. So from that, we developed um, a program, a, a, a structured program. So kind of to circle back around where we're at now, we're a center for innovation, education, and research, but because we mindfully collected data, we looked at our student outcomes throughout the 10 years, it's gotten us to where we are now with regards to um, our center. Um, and I could, I'll talk to you more about it as we ask other questions, but we're still a group of three, but I like to say that our enterprise are our students. Um, and I can speak to a little bit of what some of our doctorate students are doing in the telehealth space with regards to research. So we're three with about 
50 students every year. And thanks, Tina. Uh, I'll mm -hmm. jump in. Um, so I like Tina and Judd. Um, I wear multiple hats and those hats have kind of evolved over the years. Um, but they, the central theme of those hats has been uh, to one degree or another telehealth uh, and research around telehealth and uh, also uh, very engaged with the educational uh, efforts related to that and have had the pleasure of working with Tina uh, on several of those initiatives as well. So I'm currently the Chief Medical Information Officer for MUSC and in that role um, I, am, I take a pretty broad focus on uh, issues relating to clinical health IT and how they impact uh, provider staff workflow, patient provider satisfaction. Um, and so looking at that uh, in terms of how it impacts research or, or uh, works with research, uh, a lot of it is really on the data and analytics side um, where I'm, uh, I work with our data and analytics teams uh, on ensuring that our providers have the data they need, that our researchers have the data they need. Um, and it's given me an interesting perspective on some of the core kind of foundational approaches to how to um, prepare your data, collect your data, aggregate and all of that to make research um, more feasible. Um, we also in this role <clears throat> from a telehealth specific standpoint, um, I, uh, I don't know if you can see the building behind me, uh, but that's Sean Jenkins Children's Hospital it opened almost exactly a year ago. And one of my initiatives uh, for that building was to develop a telehealth program, um, a telehealth uh, platform such that we have telehealth connected uh, directly into the patient's TV uh, in every room of the building uh, to allow our providers, many of whom work off campus um, to allow them to easily call in and connect to their patients, to allow families to call in, um, to really improve care coordination. And this was all developed over, you know, uh, two to three years prior to the opening of the building, which opened actually the week before the COVID shutdown. So uh, it was a amazing benefit to have this program in place when that happened, because due to restrictions on visitation and patient staff protection, uh, and um, family protection uh, and all the factors that came into play with COVID, having that system in place and functional um, really made a huge difference for our teams. And then uh, kind of further with the COVID response, um, I was one of the uh, many leaders uh, at the institution who were very engaged in, uh, in rapidly scaling our telehealth um, services to allow our providers to continue to see their patients during the uh, pandemic. Um, my uh, other hat, which I uh, don't uh, technically wear now, uh, but certainly uh, was really responsible for a lot of my engagement in, um, in health IT uh, during my career was working with the Center for Telehealth at MUSC. Um, I was the uh, medical director for telehealth optimization prior to my current role. And that was very heavily engaged in research and evaluation of telehealth programs. Uh, and one of my main focuses there was on integrating evaluation, program evaluation and research um, <clears throat> and data collection into uh, telehealth programs from the moment of implementation, making sure you're having those discussions around how do we collect data? How are we gonna use the data? Um, and how are we going to evaluate this program um, from very early on in the process. It was also very engaged in the education and training component. Prior to that, I was the uh, medical director for inpatient and emergency teleconsultation. Uh, and my first program was a pediatric critical care outreach program. And really, uh, we, you know, one of the ways that we were able to advance that program effectively and advance payment for that program from uh, insurers was collecting data from even before we rolled the program out. We, got, we had baseline data on, um, on our uh, consultations via phone to remote emergency departments that we were collecting using red cap surveys for a year before we actually rolled the uh, telemedicine program out. And that allowed us to 
um, demonstrate some pretty robust outcomes um, uh, for our program. Um, I also uh, was a part of our Center of Excellence, um, which is a HRSA funded uh, program. And we were selected for that really not only because we're in a rural state uh, with a lot of chronic disease, um, but also because of the breadth of programs that we've developed and the experience that we've had both positive and negative on program development uh, to be able to help other sites around the country to expand on those programs. Um, another hat that I wear is for the Sprout um, Telehealth Research Collaborative. Obviously that's very focused on uh, research and evaluation. And we had a discussion about that yesterday, so I won't go into too much detail there, but I had the pleasure of working with John on that. Um, and then the final hat is um, as the chair of the American Academy of Pediatrics section on telehealth. And, you know, that's been an interesting evolution over the past several years. Um, I got engaged with the AAP because I was uh, working on uh, pediatric telehealth guidelines uh, with the ATA. And back in 2014, when I first reached out to the AAP about endorsing those guidelines, uh, essentially the answer was hell no, uh, because there was a huge amount of pushback around telehealth from the AAP. And my point then, uh, which remains the same now, is you know you can't standing basically what you're doing by saying no is standing on the train tracks and putting your hand up. Uh, as though you're not going to get run down. Uh, so, you know, the, the goal is you got to get on the train and drive it. And because that the real uh, power in influencing the direction of telehealth is, is in helping, is serving as the subject matter experts, as the clinical experts, as people that are engaged with this process and really helping to direct um, the future of telemedicine for pediatrics. And that I'm proud to say the AAP has been uh, very receptive to that approach. And um, actually during the pandemic, um, got HRSA funding for $6 million to uh, essentially uh, guide the direction of pediatric telehealth, especially for uh, medically complex patients, adolescents, uh, and um, mental and behavioral uh, therapy. Um, so they've really been very, uh, they've taken a very active role in leading uh, telehealth efforts for the pediatric population. And clearly, um, in order to do that effectively, uh, we really focus on uh, getting the data and evaluating programs, both for the AAP and providing the um, resources through Sprout for others to evaluate their programs. Uh, so that is the um, quick version. I don't know how quick that was, but uh, <laughs> like Tina and, and Judd, uh, there's a lot that I could I could talk about, um, but I'll I'll pause there. <clears throat> yeah, th thanks very much, uh, Dave, uh, Judd, and Tina uh, for that that's overview of, of of you know your your program. How you've been able to incorporate some of this uh, research. What I, what I like to do uh, is now with that background, that's, uh, I'd like to do is focus on a few topics. And I think the, the, the purpose of this uh, uh, panel is to really discuss what the role of research is in, in, in the various programs and the activities that you, you all three of you have just described. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the first topic that um, is, you know, is the, as follows. So some may argue that doing research and delivering of clinical care cannot ha happen simultaneously. Uh, what do you guys think about that statement? And in your opinion, you know, how have you been able to sort of you know, make that happen simultaneously? And what would be the value of being able to do research in sync with telehealth operation? And I just, let me just also say, when I say research, I, you know, I, I'm not limiting it to clinical trials or, or case control studies. I'm I, I'm I'm think about it in the broad sense of knowledge discovery, uh, and how that impacts telehealth operations. And anybody else in the audience with other qu questions similar to this, please just jump in, and I'm going to just kind of monitor the chat as well. So, so I'll jump in first. You have to do research when you're rolling out new programs, and you are doing research. You just don't know it. 
And then you have to decide what research is important. Tina does research because she looks at the impact of her programs on how people perform comparing before and after. That might not be research in somebody's mind. It might be, was a program successful? We look at research and at the beginning when you start you look at research with things that are kind of meaningless for the big picture, but they're like, right, how many app downloads do you have? How many visits you do? They're just categorizing numbers of things that happen. But your marketing departments, they do marketing research. They're looking at how are you driving people there? For example, pre-COVID, we know that in our scheduled visit program, 75% of patients who did a scheduled visit were because their doctor told them to do it. So trying to get the patients to do it makes no sense. Getting the doctors to have a good experience so they'll refer the patients to do it makes sense. And, and then we get into why the doctors have a bad experience. And these are operational, you know, not big picture research things. Um, but so we started having a survey when the doctors finished the visit, like what's wrong with it? And, and you know, was it, was it perfect? Was it not perfect? And then we could get into what browser did they use? Where are they? You know, that we discovered that if you lived near the local high school during COVID, you had a really bad telemedicine experience because all those kids were on Zoom and the Wi-Fi was bad. It turns out it wasn't what platform are you on, whether you're using Chrome or anything to do with our telemedicine platform. You just lived in an area where Wi-Fi wasn't good enough for everybody to be on Zoom at the same time. So we moved those providers to the hospital and they now had a better experience. They were still safe, but they couldn't do it at home. That's research that's operations that you need to do to improve your operations. But but like Tina and John and I, you know, every time I'm on a call or a meeting with, with these guys, I'm like, oh, my God, what great stuff. You know, we've gotten NIH funding for what you would consider to be real clinical trials. We, we are randomizing diabetic patients who have hemoglobin A1Cs out of control to two different sets of care delivery mechanisms. One that is, we'll call it usual care, but it's really enhanced usual care because we know they already failed usual care. And, and one that includes sending case-based workers to their home and teaching them to use telemedicine so they could have more touch points. That, that's a true clinical trial, R01 type research funded through the NIH to do that. So we're taking it from how do I get a patient on the platform? How do I get a doctor on the platform through what is the optimal care delivery model and what is the best place to use telemedicine? And I think if you don't do these things together and don't treat your patients and get new knowledge from your patients, you're going to be stuck in 2019. And, and the one thing we know is we're never going to be back in 2019 again. So we better figure out how to go forward. Yeah, I would <clears throat> absolutely echo that. I think people do more research than they realize because they have a definition of research that is this kind of scary, um, you know, mammoth idea of, of, uh, of developing protocols and, and submitting grants and, you know, taking a huge chunk of your time. But, you know, if you've got a dashboard that you use to help with your program operations and to do quality improvements and, um, you know, really... Uh, drive some of the decision making, you know, you are researching, uh, you know, whether it's quality improvement or the um, more of the program demonstration uh, type of research, I think you're still doing that. The other thing that the other point that I really try to make is, you know, 10 years ago, I was having the conversation um, with leaders at the ATA around the importance of doing research and supporting research to help move policies forward and to um, really um, get telehealth kind of advancing in the right direction. And I was told um, to, I was basically told uh, research is too slow. It's an ivory tower. There's no, we, people just need to do it. And it'll, and, and it'll you know, it, we had to focus on adoption, not on research. And I've heard that before, you know, research is too slow, research is too slow except I heard that 10 years ago and I heard it again eight years ago and again five years ago and again last year. And guess what? We're still having the same struggles that we were having then prior to COVID certainly, but even after COVID, there's still, what are the conversations we're having now? Should we pay for this? How do we pay for this? What's the impact on utilization? How does it inter interface with normal health operations. These are the same questions that we could have been really focusing on 10 years ago and we'd have answers now, right? 
So I think now there's obviously a lot of movement in that direction because we've got this huge trove of data from the pandemic response and everyone doing telehealth. And we are, and there's the attention of, of entire health systems on doing this. And they're saying, man, I wish we had actual, like meaningful, actionable data that we had studied and, and we could answer some of these questions, but now we've got the data and we can really dive into it. You know, it's, I think you need to understand, you know, there that research and evaluation occurs on different timelines depending on what kind of research and evaluation you're talking about. If you're looking to do a descriptive study, then you can do that relatively quickly. If you're looking to make business decisions and use dashboards and analytics, you can do that relatively quickly. You know, if you're looking to do some huge randomized control trial where the clinical outcomes aren't going to actually be apparent for two years, then yeah, that's going to take a longer period of time. But it doesn't mean that you shouldn't do any research because you have, because, you know, this type of research takes a long time. You have to invest in it. You have to understand what your goals are for the research and try to think ahead because there is, you know, there is information, there's, there's uh, guidance that we could have from research that we know is going to be really important two years from now, but we have to get started now. So we get, if we can focus on uh, that understanding of what's the information that we can obtain quickly and get that information, we've got our moderate medium term goals and we've got our long term goals, then you can still focus on getting those getting those processes started so that five years from now we're not asking the exact same questions that we're asking today and not having answers to them. Um, so you know that means working across different uh, organizations, collaborating, funding uh, the research, and um, you know really being thoughtful about the kind of information that we're going to need. Um, you know, in the future. Um, I would agree. Uh, I think people are petrified of research and to your point, they're doing it and don't even know they're doing it. Uh, and it's, and we have to start at the bottom. You have to start with the descriptive data. You're not going to jump to a clinical trial and, and that's okay. Uh, and then the organizations that don't have research teams and deep pockets I'm gonna go back to the academic setting. Again, I've got a foot in both worlds. Um, tap into your universities, tap into your doctorate students. They, they need projects, they wanna do projects. They'll come in and beg you to give them something that's meaningful in the telehealth world. Um, over at CHKD, Children's Hospital of the King's Daughters, I'll give you an example of a simple research project that's a pilot, but and that's okay, and I think we'll build on that. Um, RPM has not been big in PEDS. It wasn't big. We were working on this before um, COVID happened. We were using some devices at the university through CTIR, and the company loaned devices to us to 20 kids over at the Children's Hospital to pilot that in a pain and palliative care program. I'm an N of one. I have two jobs, I can't do everything. So I tapped into two students that then came over and, and assisted with this project. You know, I did basic um, red cap entering on patient data, family data, pulling information from the EMR. But then one of the students looked at a two group for, that looked at parents that had it versus parents that didn't to see whether um, they felt more engaged with the provider, whether they felt they had a better sense of well-being. Um, there was a poster yesterday. The other one looked at operations to see whether it changed the way the practice ran. I mean, this is an example of research that students helped us with, both from C-tier and in the clinical setting. It was free. It was free labor. And they're preparing now to take that to administration to see what worked, what didn't work, can we go forward and perhaps push this out to a different population? So it's, it's real time, simultaneous practice and research. Yeah, I'm just going to add one more thing. I, I, I've adjusted and, you, you know, maybe David Tina will and John will agree or disagree. I, I think the world is about Shark Tank. Like, I don't know who watches the show Shark Tank, but when you, you know, when you're 
and I recognize many of your names from your companies that you have, you, you know, or, or academic backgrounds on, on this call. But when you're pitching to a venture capital company, right, you're solving an unmet need. When you're writing a grant, you're solving an unmet need. If you watch Shark Tank, the thing you hear is, I love you, but I don't love the product. They have to believe in you. You have to sell the team. That's part of a grant. Is it innovative? That's part of it. What's your methodology and how are you going to take it forward? That's part of it. And finally, what's the ROI? What's the return on investment for the money or time you're, you're asking for? And, and so leveraging research as all of you are trying to grow your programs or sell your products, leveraging research as the way to make it Shark Tank and prove there's a more or less can't lose ROI if the institution invests in this is critical. That's the way we're going to go forward. And I see Joe's comment in the chat about CTEL and listen to Dave's comments about how he's been pushing the same boulder up the hill or should have been pushing the same boulder up the hill for the last 10 years in terms of data. I mean, there's so much data out there right now. And, and as dysfunctional, well, I'm not going to say any political things, a as much as the government is running like the government has generally been running for the last four or five years, there is bipartisan support in both the House and the Senate to move telehealth ahead. What's missing is that shock tank presentation with the data to show the ROI. You know whose fault that is that that's not there? It's all of your faults, my faults, and this panel's fault that we haven't been able to produce that data yet so that everybody can invest in something they really, really badly want to invest in. And now we are never going to have a better opportunity. Like that boulder just got way easier to push mm -hmm. because people care about it. By 2022, they may care a lot less. So please, please, as you're doing stuff, you know, take Joe's warning, share your data, whether you're a company or, or a health system, put your data out there so it can be leveraged to move policy. Because at the end of the day, if we don't get this stuff reimbursed, it's going to fall by the wayside. John, I think that's, uh, those are really good, uh, good points. And, and <clears throat> I want to just also call out some, some uh, questions in the chat relate, related to data. Uh, it's, since it sound, sounds like it's a good time to do that. So uh, we have a comment here in the chat uh, regarding medical students and regarding the lack of data availability to conduct cost-effective analysis or policy evaluation. Um, any thoughts about you know, how we can make this data more available and what were some of the steps that we may need to take moving forward? So one of the things that we're working on in Sprout uh, is the uh, economic framework. Um, for evaluating telehealth programs. And it is, uh, we've got one article that's pending publication. Uh, we've got another one focused more on kind of the policy part of it uh, that's submitted. Um, you know, the idea, one of the challenges around the, um, around the cost uh, discussion is that lack of kind of standardization in terms of what we're talking about when we are talking about costs, right? People look at um, telehealth and often they look at it independently or they look at it as an either or with other clinical operations. Either you're doing this in person or you're doing it via telehealth and therefore we need to look at the cost of telehealth versus the cost of in-person care. And that's not what we need to be evaluating. We need to be looking at the cost of you know, including telehealth in your operations and including telehealth as part of your healthcare system approach versus not including telehealth as part of your system approach. That means you actually take into account the cost of in-person care along with the cost of providing telehealth services because the ideal approach is really an integrated system where, you, where it's not about whether you're doing it via telehealth or whether you're doing it in person. It's about what is the condition you're trying to treat, who is the patient you're trying to treat, and what is the best approach in that moment at that time, or in a longitudinal approach to provide care, whether it's in person or virtually. And so you really need to look at the cost, uh, the cost and the benefits from that standpoint, because if you present data to Congress, for example, the CBO, right, and what you're presenting is saying, well, telehealth costs this much and in-person care costs this much, or telehealth you know, it, it provides these benefits and in-person care provides these benefits. You know what question they're gonna answer? They're gonna answer the question of should we provide, should we pay for telehealth or in-person care? 
And that's not the question we want them to be answering. We want them to be answering the question of, should we pay for telehealth as part of the system of care and part of the care that we're providing? And so the data you present should be focused on showing the benefits of an integrated model of telehealth services. So really, you know, that's where you start, have to start thinking of this stuff very early on because you have to figure out what are the driving uh, questions that different stakeholders are asking and how are they going to make those decisions? What decision do you want them to make that will best set up telehealth for moving forward in the future? And how do we therefore ask the questions and develop the studies and the research necessary to, to give that information that they need to hear to make the right decision about how to move forward? Thank you. And, um... I think Judd, a moment ago, you mentioned uh, um, a, a, you know, a study comparing with diabetes management, chronic care management, chronic care management. Um, and and um, there's a question in the chat by Molly Jones, uh, also about chronic care management. Are there you know, evidence-based research studies that guide this work in using telehealth to optimize chronic care management? Um, and I, I wanna kind of bring that up in the context of effectiveness and cost and what we're talking about in terms of uh, data and evidence-based research. And any thought about that for Tina, yeah. uh, Judd, and Dave? Well, I think, you know, what Molly highlights the point that, that Dave is saying, and, and part of the problem is, you, you know, she runs, a, you know, is involved in a health system. And I, I you know, Molly, I'm, I, I may be speaking out of turn for your health system. So it's a general statement. It's not, not actually for your center specifically in, in Wisconsin, but, but at, at, at the end, at the end of the day, you can't do things that aren't reimbursed. So here's the question: is, is your health system in Wisconsin or my health system in Philadelphia going to do something for free to prove to payers who are just going to not pay for things for as long as humanly possible that that it's not valuable? And, and, and this is, I'm going to say this, and I, you know, I would. I'm not going to apologize to payers on the phone. I'm going to acknowledge that you hate me and just leave it at that. But, you, you know, a payer's responsibility isn't to the patient. I'm sorry. They make their money off the employers. They make their money by not paying for patients. And, and at the end of the day, their, their job and maybe their fiduciary responsibility, if they're a for-profit company, there is to their shareholders. So if they have a choice to pay or not to pay, their legal obligation might actually be to not pay rather than to pay. So we're stuck in this quagmire where we, we, we can't get evidence unless we're funding it ourselves or we're doing real high quality research and that takes years. Funding it ourselves, I don't know, we publicly lost $298 million during COVID. So funding it ourselves doesn't seem very likely uh, over the next couple of years for many of the academic health systems that lost a boatload of money. So to the payers, hell, that's just two more years. I don't need to pay for it. Didn't, didn't hurt them to pay for it during COVID. Let's be real, because there was no elective surgery. And, and if you go online and look at the profit margins in mid-2020, for, for the commercial payers, they've never been greater. So whoopee, you paid for some telemedicine visits when you paid for no surgery. What we really need to go forward is the ability to A, have you pay for it, but B, know what's going to happen. Because right now what we're doing is we're kicking the can down the road Medicare will pay for it till the end of this year. Commercial payer X will pay for it through June, Y through September. Well, telemedicine's not free. You think it's free because it's on video and you don't need an office to see the patient. But if I can't cancel my lease, it's not free. And if I don't know if you're gonna pay for it for the next decade, I can't change my lease. So research is important to inform how best to provide patient care. It's critical, but requiring research before we change for things that are intuitively obvious 
is just a delay tactic so we don't need to pay for it. And then who's gonna fund the research? So we're really in a super difficult place on, on this. And if we flip the switch overnight to value-based care and health systems were on the hook for everything, it'd be really easy. You'd see telemedicine take off. And if you look around the country and look at, and, and I'm not gonna name places, but you know these big places where they're responsible for the employee contributions, they're responsible for the patients and the costs are wholly theirs because they own the insurer. Every one of them is doing tons and tons and tons of telemedicine. So we know telemedicine works. So uh, there, there are no, so that, that's a very long winded, you know, you know frustrated, you know, uh, background to your question, Molly, that we, we're not getting evidence-based research studies because somebody's got to pay for them or, or they get delayed. So Sprout is going to come out with great stuff for children. Uh, Kristen Rising leads our research program at Jefferson. She has a Center for Connected Care. She's got multiple, multiple, you know, real federal grants comparing exactly what Dave said, integrated programs with telemedicine to programs without telemedicine. We're going to get this data it just might be too late. Judd, but uh, I would say also though, um, at the same time, it, it, it doesn't mean that you can't standardize data collection. You can't identify certain data elements that ought to be tracked as we move forward because uh, there would be lost opportunities if we didn't and, and begin some of this you know, collaboration among centers to, to uh, collect this data and learn from this data. And we can be, that can be done now. Correct. 100% agree. And you guys are my idols in the Sprout Network for pulling this sort of stuff together. It's phenomenal effort that you guys have done. And, and there's also a lot of pilot data out there. There are pilot studies looking at chronic disease management. You know, we need to we need to pull those studies together and do a Delphi and then from these small pilot studies build a larger study. We need to we need to pay attention to what others have done and not repeat their errors. I mean, I, I tell students all the time, if you knew what the answer was, you wouldn't be doing the study. You know, it's okay to fail, write up your failure. Uh, write up your research study that was a failure, write up where you lost money, write up where it didn't work so that the next person doesn't make the same mistake. That's okay. Yeah, I think we'll bring that up. Um, I love pilot studies because they actually represent the contextual effects and impact at the local level because it's, it's called pilot. You kind of learn a lot. Um, could, could, could you talk a little bit about competencies? Because I think as we talk about to payers, they are always um, you know, really focus on um, not only overutilization, but they also increasingly focus on safety. And I think competency directly impacts safety. So your work with competency is, is critical. And can you talk a little bit about that? That me or you, David? We doing double A and C or APN? Uh, yeah, yeah. That's that's. Uh, I will defer to your expertise on that one. I can speak to it, but I would be almost embarrassed to do it with you on the call. Well, competencies live both at the academic setting and also in um, practice settings. And where we have fallen short in the last several years, and and I think COVID has pushed this forward very quickly. Uh, is it's not been required in nursing. It's not been required at the advanced practice nursing level and just most recently at, um, in medical schools. You know, everything you do, everything we do clinically is competency-based, you know, and why would telehealth not be competency-based? Telehealth is not a practice, but it is a skill and it's a skill that needs to be learned. And for something as simple as the, the interpersonal skill set for a telehealth encounter. I think people didn't realize how difficult that was until everybody started Zooming this year. And in a Zoom meeting, the world knows what can go wrong with a virtual visit, right? And unless we teach the unique competencies and skill sets for this type of encounter, um, I think, and Judd, I think you and I have talked about this in the past, I think eventually the payers are going to say, hey, you know, hold the phone. How do I know that this provider knows, knows how to do telehealth? I'm not going to reimburse them. You know, show me how they learned it. Show me that they can do it. And it's the competencies that are going to drive practice. 
And um, like any skill set that you're learning, you're going to go from novice to expert. And competencies are going to frame that development of um, how to how to do telehealth. I mean, Judd, you can speak to that as well. Yeah, I I, I 100% agree with you. And you know, I'll I'll throw in at some point in the chat. You, you know, like you have a center, Jefferson has a National Center for Telehealth Education and Research. You know, Avera has a bunch of us involved in putting together what they're calling the American Board of Telemedicine. And, and there are, you know, there are now real training programs that people could be doing um, that e either give you CME for as little as an hour on how to do it, give you certificate programs. We're, we're going to have health service delivery innovation, masters and PhD programs in, in the next year at Jefferson. So people could really learn how to lead in this place as well as boatloads of certificate programs. So I, I'm, I'm a little afraid of exactly what you said, that the payers are going to say you need a proven competency because for the cardiologist, they don't ask you whether you use a Lipman cardiology stethoscope, or I like to say a Fisher-Price stethoscope. They don't know how you're listening to the heart. They, they don't care whether you're on the third floor or the fifth floor. They don't care if you have glasses or contact lenses. Why, why should they care if it's video? But, but, I, but I do think if we started getting everybody trained, those concerns would go away. So we should take the competencies you, the AAMC, and everybody else have worked on. We know what the secret source is. Just mm -hmm. build it in the med school from day one. Get everybody trained and take that off the table. Right. Absolutely. It's very similar to I, th I think when, when we go to medical school, nursing school, or any other health re you know health health delivery system um, education is that they teach us to know the limits of what we could do and could not do. They teach us humility. They teach us how to ask questions. They teach us. All of these things that are really kind of, in, you know, really important in, in the course of kind of taking care of our patients. And I think now with the new technology, uh, you know, it, 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 you really need to learn that. I find it very interesting, that, by the way, Judd, that we never had a board, American board of phone, uh, ex, uh, phone competency, because we've been using the phone for a long time to, to take care of patients. <laughs> Well, you know, and, and that raises the difference between what is self-interest in preserving your own money and what is quality of care, right? They, nobody was paying for phone calls, so they didn't give a crap if it was good quality. They just didn't care. Now that we want them to pay for telemedicine, quality is an excuse to not pay because clearly a video call with audio is as good as a phone call and nobody cared about the phone call. So John, I think your point is brilliant. This is all about how do I not put money out there? One of the things I'd also like to say with regards to the, the competency and the training the providers of tomorrow is how are we gonna train the faculty that are training the providers of tomorrow? Because our, our faculty that are living in the academic settings right now are, um, I would argue, have probably not utilized telehealth. So how are we going to teach the faculty to teach telehealth? Um, and that's one of the things we're doing in our certificate program is we're training faculty, interprofessional faculty. Um, so yeah, that's a concern. I think that gets to is what, you know, one of the key things, and this is putting my CMIO hat on a little bit, you know, in terms of making having something be trainable, it gets to how you develop the programs as well. And the more, and it's got to be simple and it's got to be, as standardized as you can possibly make it, right? Because people talk about, certainly when you're talking about electronic health records, the click count, you know, how many, how long does it take to go through a new a workflow? And the degree, the, the degree to which people will learn and utilize a new workflow within the electronic health record is just monumentally impacted by the number of clicks that it involves, right? And how different it is, obviously, from what you were already doing. And so for the importance with, with telehealth and integrating it into your healthcare system is in making it as similar to what you already do as possible and in minimizing the amount of, of clicks, the amount of steps that you need to do to kick off a telemedicine visit or to be engaged in that sort of service, because that will greatly simplify your training and allow you to not only train larger numbers of people, but train them more effectively and have them retain it better, so you have to think about that in terms of your, um, in terms of setting up your programs from the very beginning. Thank you. Um, 
In terms of, uh, I'm going to just, uh, this is a great discussion. We have about 20 minutes left, so we, we have plenty of time. <laughs> uh, but uh, let's, uh, one of the tools that was mentioned earlier, I think Tina, you mentioned this, was um, the uh, Delphi method. And, and I think I want to I I wanna, uh, start that off because I want to talk about some of the research tools that are, that are used in research that could potentially be then used for telehealth programs. Uh, that these are, should be easy to use tools and, and these should be pretty straightforward and, and pretty easy to implement. Uh, let's start with the Delphi method as one of these tools, Tina. And maybe can you talk a little bit about your, your experience with that? Well, how we utilize the Delphi method to develop our competencies is it's essentially a search of the literature. Um, so we don't need to reinvent what's already been done. Um, we had a team of researchers that reviewed the literature, reviewed the studies for, um, for rigor, and then um, came up with the competencies in our coursework utilizing, I'm, I'm not an expert at the Delphi method other than um, utilizing it on my team. Um, John, you wanna speak a little bit more to that? Yeah, sure. No, so it's I'm, a I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to put you on but- No, that's all right. I was like, uh, digging into the literature on our team to develop our competencies. You go, John. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I'm not an expert in that, but, but, I, but I think the, the point is that um, you were able to use a research method yeah. uh, that is, that is commonly when there's not a lot of evidence or, the, or mm -hmm. when there is evidence, but you really need that expert panel to, to understand um, or to kind of deliberate on, on the applicability of, of something. So there, there's, there's a couple of methods out there, uh, Delphi being one of them, nominal group technique being another one where it's a consensus method. Uh, but it, it's, it's, it's a really great way of, of really kind of coming, come to consensus and developing guidelines. Mm -hmm. And you've been able to do that with competency. And I know at Sprout, we, we are trying to do that for uh, this, you know, coming up with what is a virtual exam look like? And I know there's, then there's been some publications that uses a similar method to come up with virtual exam nation best practices or potential better practices. Uh, so if I could say kind of circling back, I was kind of caught off guard is, is essentially having your team of experts and reviewing each of the articles and discussing it. You know, what, what's right, what's wrong, what works for you. It's, it's a collaborative approach with a group of experts that we're also doing to your point in Sprout. Yeah, and, 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 and you undergo go several rounds of, right. uh, you know, and, and there's, a, there's a template actually uh, that we could potentially probably find, find literature and find a template to provide for those who are interested. And then that's just one of many methods. Yeah, what I would, what I would say, you know, one, one of the underlying principles of, of Sprout really is helping people to not reinvent the wheel, right? You spend so much time, uh, people spend so much time coming up with the processes to do different things within their programs. And, you know, why, if, if we can disseminate um, uh, approaches and frameworks and guidance and, and protocols that uh, allow people to save time on that aspect that can be applicable broadly, then not only does it save people time, um, and an effort to move things along more quickly, but it creates a standardization that is extremely important to multi-center collaboration on, on research, uh, right? And then the, <clears throat> the other thing that's important to point out in getting to um, the question of, you know, how does research or how can you really align things um, for research, you know, within your institution or outside, the important thing to realize is that alignment for research is not just about alignment across different organizations. It's about alignment within, within your institution because the different, uh, uh, there are different areas of your institution that use data to advance their goals, right? But they use it, the, they use it in different ways. You know, the QI team uses it using poten potentially different processes. The administrative and operational teams use it, you know, with different processes and with different end goals sometimes. Generally, the differences are about the timeline and kind of how, how controlled are you going to be around biases, potential biases. Researchers care a lot more about potential biases in the data um, uh, in terms of it being publishable. 
um, and and you know making sure that you have your processes in place. You know, a, a researcher's got to have a strict protocol that they follow throughout the course of their study, or otherwise they have to submit a revision, right? Versus QI, which is all about making changes to your process um, as you get the data to come in, and then you know the administrative and operational component is like you practically make cha make changes on the hour by hour basis sometimes. But what if all three of those areas were using the same data, right? Think about the alignment and the synergies you could get if your researchers, your QI team, and your administrative and operational leaders were working off the same data set. Right, because now that we're all really focused in on our telehealth processes, there's a good potential to do that. And so the idea would be um, kind of agree upon what are the what are the metrics and measures that you want to follow that you'll be able to not only research but also do quality improvement activities on and use to drive your day-to-day -day operations. Right, and then you've got <clears throat> you've got. This data, this data source um, that everybody is engaged in making sure is up to date, is streamlined, is accurate, is, you know, the data is clean and usable. You're developing dashboards that you could use on the administrative and QI and research side. I think that's where um, there's a great deal of potential within an organization for alignment. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Tina. Um, I, 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 oh. I, I have a thought really, really quickly as I'm as I'm listening and, and thinking, we now have three sets of competencies that I'm aware of. We have the ones that were developed through the um, HRSA funded APN that we published. We have the Harvard Delphi that Judd, you were involved in and the double AMC that was uh, published last week. I, I would challenge a group of us to look at the three to see the common threads? And is there an overarching set of competencies? Should, is it okay to have three different sets? Just think from a research standpoint, these three developed competencies, I would challenge us to look at them and see the differences and the commonalities. And you know, and, and I'll add to that, Tina, separate from competencies, but maybe more aligned with research, right? Because competencies are aligned with education. Absolutely. Is, is, you know, we put out the National Quality Forum, put out in August of 2017, uh, a measurement framework for telemedicine, which, which was really designed to develop a framework for, you, you, you know, measurements and CMS payment and reimbursement. Mm -hmm. and, and within that, there's domains and subdomains. Mm -hmm. and, and so when we've published research and when we've written grants, we've always tagged it to that. You know, the domains are simple, like you can't argue with them. It's access, it's finances, it's experience and it's effectiveness. And, and then there's subdomains within each. And, you know, one of the words that got coined in that report, and we keep giving Christy Henderson credit for it because she came up with it, even though she doesn't remember it, um, other than me saying that all the time, but David used is actionable information. A mm -hmm. And it's how do you get enough actionable information to make sure the patient gets to the right next step as compared to everybody's intuitive thoughts, which is, did I get the diagnosis right? Because, you know, after 10 minutes in the ER or an office-based visit, we're ordering more tests and more consults. So to think that we're going to get a diagnosis right in 10 minutes of a telemedicine visit is insane. We just have to not miss the fact they need the following test. So, so within those competencies, I would also say, let, let's look to those national quality forum metrics and other things used by payers um, rather than purely the educational competencies. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks, Judge. And, and in fact, Judge, uh, Judd, uh, we, we actually looked very heavily at the NQF uh, framework as well as the World Health Organization and other, other, other framework. But, a lot of the NQF frameworks when we developed the Sprout uh, framework for pediatrics, uh, where we you know, call for a, a lot of the domains and subdomains in the NQF. Um, and we also uh, you know, put emphasis on, on health outcomes as well. And, and, and so there, you know, that, it would be great uh, to really kind of take a look at some of these um, measurement frameworks uh, and, and then plus the cost effective analysis, cost economic framework as well to really kind of develop um, an approach that we can recommend to uh, uh, programs uh, to, to use. I think what programs are, t are really looking for is a very simple and straightforward um, way of getting started with, with 
okay, the data, the kind of, and, and, and access is probably a, a big one. Uh, I, I hear it over and over in any kind of uh, measurement talk that we do or conversations we have is access to care. And it's interesting. I mean, you could have robust discussions on what is access. I, I was on another access panel. I won't define it because I don't know that the information is public yet, but it is access. Someone calls for an appointment and gets an appointment scheduled for three weeks from now because they asked for an appointment and they got one. Is three weeks from now okay if the patient is okay with three weeks from now? Is a response to an email with a medical information saying, I think you should do this, is that access? Or is that just kicking the can down the road? Like, you, you know, these things get so complicated as, as to how you even define it because you could have a response to asynchronous telemedicine that doesn't solve your problem but you had access, you got to ask the questions, but we didn't solve your problem. And, and, and so it is not easy to, to figure this stuff out. Thank you. Um, we have other, uh, uh, I'm gonna just read some of the chats here uh, that people have brought up, very good points. Um, Joe had uh, commented, I'm not surprised that there are three different sets of competencies. If there are differences among them, that's not surprising either. Um, no anything to apologize. Experts differ in all sorts of issues. Why should this be any different? So they wanted to, the, the key question here is, at what point do we, do we say difference, different is good? And, uh, and important and do what, and at what point do we say we are and what you know what what should we standardize across the board and what should we uh, say different uh, is is you know permissible and uh, and actually makes more sense well I think <clears throat> to that question it kind of depends on how the how the different documents how the different approaches are being used right if if somebody's if there are differences in how competencies are determined and those competencies are being used to set state or federal regulations around payment for telehealth, I mean again, those all got goes back to payment, um, then that's a problem, right? If it's just that there, there are differences because experts differ and people can use uh, a different approach that best suits their program, then great. Um, but I think, you know, and, and Judd touched on this too, this stuff gets really, really complicated when you actually start diving into what even seems like one of the simpler questions, like using phone versus audio only versus audio video. You know, we got into this discussion in our, uh, in our uh, talk yesterday. That is extraordinarily complicated uh, because of some of the things that have been mentioned, but also because it directly impacts the equity issue. You know, people that are disadvantaged, um, financially or because of, you know, where they live or the size of their, you know, uh, where do they have private space? Do they have broadband? All of that, you know, are much more capable in many cases of conducting a visit via the phone rather than using video. And so if you limit payment for uh, phone consultations, suddenly um, you're directly, you're, uh, you're impacting the disadvantaged population more. But then there gets to be so many other questions around it um, because it's not, there's a lot of complexities. And so the question becomes, we're trying to tease all this out. How is that information going to be used? If the goal is that we want to try to legislate best practice, um, then that's going to get super complicated because, you know, you just, you end up with a legislation that is overly restrictive or that prevents innovation, et cetera, et cetera. The idea is we need to identify what the best practices are, and then we want to incentivize that rather than restricting other types of practice. And you have to rely on, to a certain degree, clinical judgment and you know the the same things that you rely on for in-person care. You know, people have the options to do a lot of different things, but if we really look at what do we want to incentivize around um, addressing the equity questions around. Uh, audio versus a audio vi uh, video versus asynchronous, et cetera, et cetera, then it becomes much more feasible just from the standpoint of how do you write the regulation and how do you write the legislation? And I think if we could kind of come together on that idea, that would be very useful. 
Yeah, I, I just put in the chat, one, one of the things we need to do, and I know this is supposed to be a discussion on research, and we've gone off on a whole bunch of like wildly different tangents. And I think it just, I'm going to say, I think that illustrates the importance of the research. Um, and, and I think that in this, as we're discussing, discussing things that may not have research behind them, let's make sure that we don't hold healthcare delivery via telemedicine to a higher standard than healthcare delivery delivered via in-person. And, and I'll give you, uh, you know, what, what I consider a really simple example. And, and an example is we've done some focus groups, post-mastectomy care. And a lot of our doctors would say, oh my God, women shouldn't have to show their breasts on telemedicine. Well, pause for a minute and, and let women make the decision because they might actually feel less creepy about doing that than showing it to a male in the room who is there alone. And, and so a lot of the things that we thought would not be popular turned out to be patient favorites. One of our early use cases, never would have guessed it, many of you have heard me say this before, it was post-vasectomy care. If we were sitting and planning in a room, we wouldn't say, let's do this with post-vasectomy care. But it turns out that's the one that grew like wildfire. And, you know, people didn't want to travel back to the hospital and they didn't mind showing their parts and it was convenient. So, so I, I don't think we legislate in anything what, like I take care of renal colic in the ER all the time. How much data is there for the way I take care of renal colic? How much data is there for the way I take care of gastroenteritis? How much data is there besides some drugs approved for nausea, you, you know, in a woman with hyperemesis? We're doing the best we could do with the data that's available to deliver emergency in-person care. Same thing in the office-based care. Let's not make telemedicine different. Let's hold us to evidence-based standards where evidence exists and where there is no evidence. Let's not require evidence before you could do it because honestly, probably 90% of what we do in medicine doesn't have high quality evidence driving that care. Yet we take care of patients with those conditions all the time rather than say, let's wait to get the evidence. That's the art. Yes, true. Mm -hmm. and I could have just art. said that, Tina. That's all I needed to say. And there's <laughs> art, and there's art in telehealth as well. Right. And you, you, you. go ahead, Tina. Sorry. No, no. I I, I was just going to touch on the equity piece. That really, we knew it existed, and then when when COVID happened, and we keep talking about COVID, the numbers showed us the issues in equity and you know sprout in the sprout group we've begun to address that but that's research i mean that's data that showed us oh my gosh we're not reaching these people through telehealth we thought telehealth was the best thing and we could reach everyone with telehealth and then we had the aha moment you know that's that's research that's data that's analyzing the data and then solving a problem yeah, I think, I, I think you absolutely um, hit a great point there um, because re research is really knowledge discovery. And mm -hmm. I, I think anytime we discover an aha moment and we discover something new, you've done some type of research. Uh, you know, you've complete, you know, and, and, and you know, I think that the complexity comes into sort of analyzing data. So that's the other half of research is you collect the data, you process it and you analyze it. And then the interpretation of, of that analysis is, is what's sometimes so complex and important actually to, in order to you, 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 you know, it, you, your conclusions or what, what, what you think they are. Um, but that's important. But I, you know, I, I think um, you know, re research can be done in many, many variety of ways. And I, I think in the last two minutes, I want to just kind of sum up that um, you know, the, the, the collaboration with your research colleagues within your institution, as we have seen examples over and over today, is cr critical. Not everybody is expected to be the best RCT uh, study designer in the world, but you, you can find somebody who can do that, who's the, where, where that's their passion. And, you can, and if you really got to get them really excited about your, your, wor your world in telehealth and your problems that you're trying to solve, they're gonna be right there with you to, to, to help you do this on, on their end. And, and I think that collaboration is, is so critical. Um, we got one, I think we, oh, I think this is our last minute. So we, we uh, unfortunately, um, we wish we had more time, um, but um, 
I want to thank everybody for uh, in, their input and their questions in the chat. I want to especially thank our panelists uh, for their um, uh, input and thoughts and insights uh, today. Um, we'll, I'm going to make, try to make a copy of this chat. And what we can do is the questions that we haven't answered in the chat, what we can do is we can try to answer them. And then uh, we'll try to um, um, deliver this uh, to the uh, participants uh, today if we can. Um, any last words, uh, Tina, uh, Judd, and David? Just thanks for joining us. Thank I you. love being here. It's fun to, yeah, you know, re reminisce and chat with a bunch of friends. Miss seeing you in person. <laughs> yeah, this is really great. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody.